So we're going to talk about design thinking today, but we're going to talk about it from a different perspective. Most of the talks that I've been to on the topic are led by either product designers or service designers or people who are deeply familiar with the ins and outs of every method. And while I do it all day, every day, I don't think of myself in that category. I really feel like design thinking for me is an extension of leadership. And it's an opportunity for those of us who are leaders. And honestly, by now, most of us in our careers have some sort of leadership capacity. I view it as a capability that we can lean upon and master to help us become transformative leaders. So a slightly different angle today for the conversation. This is what I'm hoping to cover. I want us to think about this individually, and I'll share my story from, from a transformative leadership perspective. All of us have been around for a while. We've had different responsibilities. How are we thinking about our leadership journey? And how are we thinking about the capabilities that we're continuing to develop as we go through it? So that's the first piece. Let's come in through that door. I have a hypothesis based on my own experience, and hopefully Glenn will agree with me when we talk to him about his experience working together at Delta Dental, that design thinking can actually serve as an unlock for those of us who are struggling to really be the transformative leaders that we want to be. So we'll take a look at that. But we, you know, for those of us who are not terribly familiar with design thinking, most of you are, so we'll zip through that section. We'll just make sure that we all know what we're talking about. But most of the time today is actually going to be a conversation with a salt collaboratory client, Delta Dental of Washington. And we're going to speak to Glenn Puckett, who is the executive director of health transformation at Delta Dental, a super important role for the organization and for its mission. And he'll share with us what it was like to come into that role and explore design thinking as a lever for his team and for his aspirations. So we're mostly going to talk about it from that perspective and trying to get a sense by the end of the conversation of whether design thinking really can be something that even those of us who've been around for a while can reach out to and learn and start to incorporate into our worlds. I'm just going to touch a little bit. Those of you who don't, lots of you do know me, which is terrific. Those of you who don't know me, um, I'm the founder and CEO of Salt Collaboratory. And we are a design thinking, training, coaching, and consulting company. And I am doing this work through my experience as a certified design thinking instructor, which is something that I did with the Luma Institute. So about six years ago, I started to learn about design thinking. I started to see its relevance, and that prompted me to go out and really focus on this type of work. But all of my work is based on over 20 years of experience in management consulting and industry with some pretty large brands nationally and internationally in both spaces. So I just threw a few up here of working with Capgemini and Carney and Point B in Seattle, a lot of work in healthcare, but in retail and financial services. And so when I look at my experience, I feel like I've had the opportunity to view leadership capabilities in many different industries. And like I said, based on that expertise, depending on what our clients need, we offer either consulting services, training or coaching. And in some cases, like our work with Delta Dental, all three at various times of our relationship together. Today at SALT, we have some terrific clients who we really enjoy working with in healthcare, in management consulting, in technology, in RV design. So again, a very, very eclectic group of clients. And when I look at those clients, I try to think about, you know, what actually binds them together? What is the common element with all of these clients? And honestly, the thing that comes to mind for me is that the client at these companies who brought Salt Collaboratory in were all transformative leaders themselves. They all recognized that whatever they were doing was not going to be enough 
to pull off the agendas or the aspirations that they have. So let's venture into this world of transformative leadership. And often, you know, there are lots of labels for different types of leaders. When I think about transformative leaders, I think about them as the leaders who have certainly mastered the left brain part of managing situations. They know the analysis, they know the numbers, they know how to meet whatever targets they need to hit, but they're really trying to be a different kind of leader for their teams. They're trying to inspire and motivate people. They're moving into the creativity and innovation space. And they're thinking a lot about trust, inclusion, collaboration, diversity. These are not elements that they were necessarily exposed to or taught in business back in the day. So there's something going on with many of us in the leadership capacity who recognize that hitting the numbers isn't enough and that really building teams who connect with the company and the business and each other is what we need to do. So that's all good and well. Off they go into the world of trying to make this happen. They're off on their journey to become these transformative leaders and they bump into obstacles all the way. They have people who don't empathize and don't know how to do their work. They're micromanaged. They're people who don't have the courage and have this big fear of failure or they don't have the vision or they're egocentric. I mean, we can think about all of the experiences. We have good intentions as leaders and then we don't actually manage to pull it off because we're struck by these obstacles, organizational silos being a big one. And what I've seen happen is when leaders actually reach for a different skill set, if they happen to be exposed to design and design thinking, that can in fact be the unlock. Because if you look at the words on this page that describe design thinking in three bullets, I know we can't really do that, but these are some of the words we use, those of us who live and breathe this every day, emphasizing empathy, understanding the user, promoting creativity, fostering collaboration. Those are exactly the same words that the transformative leaders were aspiring towards as well. And so I think about the transformative leadership aspiration as exactly that. And I think about the design thinking body of knowledge as as the unlock or the practical tools to actually make it happen. I think about design thinking as almost a hard skill that can be learned and mastered and applied in this particular context. So I'm just going to pause there, Melissa. You can let me know if there's anything in chat, people violently disagreeing or agreeing. But that's sort of the way I want us to think about it and explore the conversation. So let's talk about it. I, I, you know, the, the thing that I feel about design thinking is we can, we can talk about it at the high level, but the rubber hits the road when it comes to do we actually know how to do it and how to bring it to our teams. So most, not most of you, I, Melissa, you can tell me what the numbers were like in terms of people understanding design thinking. Do we have a pretty good level of literacy here? I get the sense we do. We do? Okay. It's like kind of all over the place. Oh, well, even more fun. Yes. All right. So Representation. Well, terrific. So I'm going to talk through a little bit about what it is, particularly for those who are new to the topic. If anybody wants to add to the conversation, go ahead and do so. But we'll, we'll get through this so that we can really explore how it works in, in the wild. So... To break it down, and this is really the Luma Institute's definition that I'm borrowing from. For those who aren't familiar with the Luma Institute, it's a school, that's how I think about it, that has trained people like myself and Melissa and David and Glenn. I see it as an outstanding body of knowledge for those of us who, who have a day job. We're not going to quit everything and do only design thinking but who need the skill set so that we can do our own work more effectively. And what Luma tells us, which I really appreciate, is design thinking is a disciplined approach to creative problem solving in the service of people. So a lot of words there. The first thing that is helpful to me and my clients is this notion of discipline. 
because a lot of people think about design thinking as somewhat chaotic. You know, you see the the room and there's wrappings everywhere from lunch and sticky notes and how are you ever supposed to figure out what was said and done in those meetings? I want nothing to do with it. But for those of us who, who study this particular way of working, there really is some structure. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we don't need it for everything. It's not the hammer for every nail. If you're doing your day-to-day work, there could be many other ways to learn and work where this is not necessarily needed. Design thinking is needed more when we are looking for creative solutions to challenging problems, where it's not as straightforward and where we need to bring together multiple collaborators. And the last part that we're going to see here is in the service of people. So when we're doing work with design thinking as our construct, we're not doing it for the company or for the department or for some other entity. We're doing it for the people who are most impacted by the challenge. So that reminds us that we need to understand the challenge really well and understand the people who are impacted. So that's the umbrella 50,000 foot view definition, or at least one of them, there are many of them. And three things need to happen in order for us to be able to use this construct in our work or with our clients or in any situation. The first is we need to understand that discipline and we need to understand what the framework is, which door are we coming in, which stage are we at. The next is we need to understand that we're going to be working in a very different way. And I say this often, um, and I don't mean to belabor the point, but some of us have been around, or of an age, been around for a while. This way of working was not, we were not exposed to this, especially if we were in straight corporate work. The meetings were always very formal. The presentations had to be perfect in PowerPoint. There was a certain way to show up. There was a certain way to interject in the conversation. And it wasn't fluid. It wasn't structured in the way that design thinking sessions can be structured. So the mindsets and how we work are very different, especially for the corporate folks among us. And then finally, the magic ultimately is in the methods. And that's where the studying comes in. That's where the practice comes in. Because even if you get one and two right, if you don't really know how to pull together a group of 10 people from different backgrounds to come up with a solution in a limited amount of time, in a structured way, you default to a regular meeting, which we know can be excruciating for most people. So those are the three things that we need to understand. And on the framework side, these words will be familiar to anybody who works with design thinking all the time. And frankly, even for people who don't, you know, you always hear about design thinking and that whole empathy thing and the ideation and isn't it all that stuff? And yes, it is. If you really do find yourself in a situation where you're given a problem and you're expected to go all the way through and come up with an answer, you're going to be moving through more or less these five stages, but you'll be going back and forth depending on how things are going. And there's a reason, depending on which diagrams you look at for explaining design thinking, there's a reason that this one is drawn in this particular way. What you see here are essentially two diamonds. If you, I don't know if you can actually see a diamond in this, but you have one diamond over here and a second one over here. And what the diamond is really telling you is your skills need to be able to allow you to start with something complex and to use all sorts of ways to learn and understand it, to diverge and open your mind. But at the end of the day, to be able to bring it back home to the actual underlying challenge. So what design thinking does is it it prompts you to be very open-minded and very curious but it gives you the methods to be able to do that so that you don't get lost. I sometimes hear myself say to people at clients, you know, we work so hard to hire smart people, but then we never ask them what they think because we don't know what to do with the answer. What if, what if 10 people tell us what they think? 
how are we ever going to find an answer in that mess? So we're not even going to ask. What design thinking allows us to do is indeed ask those 10 people in a very constructive way, but also sort through what they told us so that we can find the underlying insights. So we always make sure we understand our challenge, but then once we understand what it is we need to work on, we look again at multiple possibilities before we zero in on what it is we actually want to launch. And so this way of working creates the space for voices, for insights, for intellect, for collaborative intelligence. And it's a way for us to work through challenges in collaboration with others. When we're doing that, when we're thinking in that way and ultimately using the methods, we work in a, in a slightly different way from what we're used to. We're not worried about perfection. We're not worried about the beautiful PowerPoint output. We're going to be drawing a lot. There's a big mess behind me here on my own walls of drawing examples and ideas and communicating visually. We're a lot more empathetic. We actually really do want to understand what people think and feel. We become very comfortable with collaboration. It's our second nature when we work this way. We're always learning and working from, with others. Creativity, the imaginative part of our skill set comes out. A lot of us think we're not innovative because we couldn't have come up with the iPhone. But every time we problem solve, we're being innovative. We're asking as many questions as we want, and we're going round and round until we get to an answer that makes sense. Now, all of that, the framework and these mindsets are only going to come together when we pull them together with specific methods. And this is what we're going to see in our case study, that if you're looking at what's written underneath each of these buckets, and this is not a, a, a recipe necessarily. They can move back and forth. They can be used in different ways. But some of these words and methods are actually not familiar to many of us who've been around. Sure, we know what interviewing is, but have we ever really done a round robin? What is that? And do we do concept posters? I don't know. And what is an abstraction ladder anyway? All of these methods, most of which are from the Luma body of knowledge, are methods that allow us to work through that framework in a productive and collaborative manner in alignment with our teammates. So keep, I could talk about this for hours, but what I really want people to understand if you're coming into design thinking for the first time is there is method to the madness that you will be working in a different way from what you've typically experienced yeah. and what's going to pull you through and make it possible is mastering different methods that you use for different stages of your work. But it is, you know, I don't know if people all understand this, but it's actually a deep skill set that takes practice. And even though you can understand it in theory, getting to mastery and being able to work with it takes investment. So that's sort of the, the gist of it. I want to just pause here and see if anybody has any questions or comments about our world of design thinking as a, as a construct. All good? I'd love to know what people really think. Because if you this every day, really think. So if some I'm getting people... some validation in the chat that it makes sense that transformational leaders are human-centered and it help, design thinking helps people get unstuck. So. Good. Okay. So thankfully we're all on the same page. So, you know, when you see it in the wild, it does indeed look something like this. So this is from an actual client scenario. This is in a healthcare setting. And if you're looking at this image, uh, I hope you see what I see. People laughing actually in a meeting, even though they're working really hard. People being incredibly creative. People being honest about what's really broken and feeling like they can share it without, in a slightly anonymous way, without worrying about repercussions. So the experience itself, just like I said, is very different from what we're typically used to in a typical meeting. And for those of us who've been living online, this experience remarkably 
can be mirrored and mimicked quite well in an online environment using tools like Mural or Miro or anything else that you guys use. So it's interesting how certainly those of us who work with this every day have been able to create this experience, not only in an offline realm, but in an online realm as well. So that's, that's how I think about it. That's how I work with clients. That's how we do it at Salt Collaboratory. But really what I want to do and spend some time on is talk about what it look, how it feels and what it looks like when we actually work with clients. So I'm excited to introduce you to Glenn Puckett, who is the executive director of the health transformation team at Delta Dental of Washington. And Glenn and I worked together for years, actually, um, and have many, many stories to tell. But Glenn, I wonder if you could, you know, come in, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you and your experience, and then put us into the story of when you were indeed made the new head of this group and had quite a steep road ahead of you. Sure. Happy to. Thank you, Hannah. Um, it's really a pleasure to be invited into the space. Uh, I have a lot of um, admiration and respect for um, Hannah's um, skill and experience. And so just being invited to participate in, in this forum is, um, it feels really good. It means I've, I figured some things out, I think, which, exactly. which I, I enjoy. Um, so just to quickly touch on my story, uh, I have a varied career um, and it has generally involved a lot of disruptive innovation, whether it was in a corporate setting, um, I, even in an anti-poverty housing and homelessness setting, in philanthropy, and then now in, in healthcare. And, and throughout that, I was able to keep myself just below the radar so that I didn't really have to deal with a lot of the politics and things that happened at a board level or an executive level. And even when I was invited into this role a few years ago, um, we were starting from scratch. Uh, we um, were going to focus on long-term innovation. Uh, we wanted to build on a history of, of innovative work that we had done in, in Delta's foundation here in Washington State. But I personally hadn't um, had any experience working directly with the executive suite and the board and um, sort of shaping what, what that process looks like and, you know, how to engage with, with those kinds of folks. So um, I reached out to Hannah in the hope that um, she could sort of hold my hand along the way and help me figure out. Um, what's different about working at that level than what I had been doing before? Um, you know, I knew I had some good instincts around uh, innovation and human-centered design, even though I didn't know the language. Um, but I really needed to understand how to bring that up a level. And, and that's why I reached out to Hannah. Um, we started off with basic coaching. Um, then we started talking about, um, you know, the design thinking. And honestly, it, it was hard. Um, it, if I hadn't had somebody sort of walking with me, I don't know if I would have stuck with it. Um, you know, you get to a point and learning new skills, learning how to do things differently, especially if you've had success doing things a certain way, can be challenging. And um, yet I quickly became persuaded that this was the way we needed to work in order to move through the complexity in our environment and the politics and the resistance to change that, that we all knew was there. Um, and so we started doing a lot more <clears throat> design thinking in terms of evaluating what our problem spaces were, um, what were the goals we were hearing from leadership, and then sort of figuring out what were the gaps between what, we, what kind of direction we were getting and what we needed to understand to deliver successful innovation and meet the goals of leadership. Um, how much further do you want me to go, Hannah? I know we... Thank you, Glenn. I think that's great. I think you, you know... The, the point that I just want people to understand is the reason why it was so covered is because the work that you and your team were trying to do, and I think Maya's on the call, was to do incredibly important work in a very challenging space. So, you know, helping people work through oral health issues, and you, of course, can speak to this much more than me, is non-trivial. There's lots of data. There's lots of information. We did indeed spend a long time just trying to figure out what it was we wanted to work on, what it was you wanted to work on um, with your team. And I think I want to just draw your attention and everybody's attention to the third bullet on the slide. Because in addition to just trying to get you and your team built going and unstuck and all of that, 
there was a meta challenge that we needed to address as well. You want to talk yeah. a little about your Yeah, work? yeah. Let, let me talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, we had become, we had a lot of experience in, um, you know, leading change around care delivery in the oral health space and working on medical dental integration, new models of care and new ways of interacting with patients and providers. Um, but the executive leadership of the organization didn't. Um, they had a lot of experience um, administering a dental benefits company. Uh, they had, you know, a great aspirational vision, a lot of motivation, um, a lot of talent. Um, but it is hard for all of us not to be captured by our environment and learn the sort of the lessons of the industries that we participate in. And so I think it was really important for us to establish with our leadership you know, what does it mean to lead change and innovation in a healthcare space? And, and, and what, are that, what are the implications for a company that is successful and mature within an existing system that we're trying to change? Um, and a lot of the biases that come into that work really can undermine our ability to, to disrupt in a positive way. So we needed to do some work connecting with leadership and really understand establishing, you know, our credibility that we had done a lot of work in this space. We knew, you know, sort of the drivers of change. Um, we needed the um, leadership to be wind in our sails as opposed to always looking over our shoulder and jumping in and, and kind of changing the center of gravity in our work. Um, but at the same time, we needed to be able to really accommodate their perspectives and ingest all the ideas that they had and really have a process that you know, gave us some discipline in terms of continuing to keep focused on the things that were going to lead us to the long-term goals. So, so that was a real dance that we had to do. Right, and that's actually where I wanted to um, start to get into the, the depth of, of the actual example. So we did all this work together, lots of different examples, different meanings. But the one that we wanted to focus on for this discussion was an executive leadership offsite. So as Glenn mentioned, wonderful executives at the organization, somewhere ex-Amazon, ex-other roles. So they didn't really know the space. And of course, as leaders, they're going to be opining on what to do. So the question was, how do we create an, a leadership offsite that gets them to connect with the content, work alongside the team, not just giving direction to the team so that they absorb and understand how difficult this is and, so, and set the stage so that the future conversations are more directed towards the outcomes they're looking for rather than doing the stance that like, you know, people are not speaking past each other rather than working together. So then we worked with you and the rest of the team to come up with a construct for this executive leadership offsite, where it was really all about getting the executive leadership, understand, getting, understanding their expectations. We didn't want to do a workshop that didn't work for them understanding the key oral health challenges. So what are we really talking about? But getting into ideation as well, so that you could start getting ready for prototyping. And anybody who runs these types of sessions is probably looking at that and thinking, you must be crazy to try to get through all of that in, I don't know, half a day or three quarters, how much time we had. But we were ambitious. And we knew we wouldn't get them again. So we locked them up in the Blake Island room somewhere in a, in a tower in Seattle. And we pushed for it, right? And in doing this, I think you and, and Maya and the others spent a lot of time actually talking to the leaders to make sure that they were ready for the session. Yeah, I would, I would just add that we, you know, initially thought, well, you know, let's write a white paper, let's share some articles, let's get them to read a bunch of things that will help them immerse in, in the content so that they can have a better understanding or a deeper understanding. And what we, we learned pretty quickly is if anything is more than maybe half a page or a page, they're not going to read it. And even if they did read it, um, they might read it one day and then, you know, it becomes sort of, sec you know, it, it falls into the background because they're so busy and they're moving from so many important conversations every day. Um, but it's very hard for them to deeply immerse themselves in the subject matter. Um, unless there's, there's real interaction around a, in a conversation. Right, right. And so what I'm going to flash up here is we knew there was a lot of work ahead of us and we knew in the time that we had that we needed to get them to understand the space and most importantly, align with the team on what was most important. There's so many things that they needed to consider. So a lot of this work in the first section was actually 
in this converging space. Here's a lot of stuff. Choose, rank, vote, show us what you think is most important. But then we wanted to spend a lot of time in the, in the ideation space as well. So for those, of, for those of you, again, who do this work, there's a lot of methods in there. There's a lot of work that we plan to push through, but we went for it anyway. And this visual is just a snapshot of all of the things that we did. Exercise after exercise, where in that moment, when they were working on whichever piece it was, the rest of the world disappeared and they were able to focus exactly on that specific question, whatever it was. And what you'll notice here is the left-hand side of this board, which is actually bigger than the right-hand side of this board, was all of that understand work. This is where we said to them, we're going to show you these issues and we're going to show you these challenges and we're going to show you these concerns. We want you to engage and we want you to help us land on challenges that we think are most important. So rather this time than last time when we did the session with Deb a little about a month ago, we focused on some of these understand methods. So anybody who's back for a second part, thank you for coming. Ask them. If you're back for a second time, we wanted to show you some slightly different messages and methods. So we're going to focus a little bit on the create side of the page. And the reason why we're talking about the methods is just to give those of you who are not that familiar with this way of working a sense of what it means to work with teams in this way. So let's look at some of the create challenges that we have. The first one we're going to talk about is how we used a method to overcome what Glenn was talking about. Rather than sending people a lot of information to read, we said, we know you're not going to read it, so we're going to play a game with you. And this method is essentially used in many different ways and many different phases of the design thinking flow. But this is where you're going to be giving people different information and you're going to be giving them play money, and you're going to have them engage with the information and use their play money to show what matters most to them. So you're getting two for the price of one. You're forcing them to engage, right? They can't buy something unless they've understood it. And you're finding the answer to what matters to them most. And there are lots of ways to design this. Um, at Salt, we've done it in the format of a store. This was very funny during COVID because we could say to people, you get your own store. You don't even have to wear a mask as you go through the aisle. And what we did here was create a store with examples of what people had already been thinking about when it came to oral health solutions in the individual system or community health space. This exercise was put together so that everybody going into ideation was on a level playing field. Coming into this exercise, you had people like Len and Maya and others who'd been thinking about this stuff forever. They were way ahead of everybody else. This was an effort to get everybody up to speed so that they could start ideating from a similar spot. So, Glenn, you have more experience with these examples. Talk to us a little bit. You don't have to go to too much detail, but talk to us a little bit about what you were thinking about when you put the store together. Well, we had enough experience uh, interacting with the, the leadership, executive leadership, that we knew that they had um, a lot of experience in the space and they had a lot, they'd done a lot of thinking about the long term goals for the company and they had ideas. Um, things that they thought would be sort of, you know, basic table stakes for the kinds of changes that we wanted to see. And, and yet they weren't always um, aligned with the kinds of drivers of change that, that our team, who was really deeply immersed in, in some of this work, were seeing. But rather than just lecturing people or sending them written documents, we really wanted to stimulate really productive, generative conversations where people had the opportunity to compare for themselves a variety of ideas and then try to go through a process of forcing themselves to choose. Um, you can't have it all because we can't invest in everything. So, you know, now that we've set the table with some basic understanding of drivers of the, of the kinds of changes we want, let's look at the kinds of things, ideas that have come up over time that we've talked about over time or some that you haven't talked about 
And if you have to actually force yourself to choose between these, some of these things, because you can't do them all, what ends up happening is you start um, focusing in on areas where there are either tensions that people have because they don't see things the same way, or you start getting people excited about things that they didn't understand before. And so the, the bio feature exercise was a way to, to put everybody's ideas on the table. So, you know, not to dismiss anything out of hand, but let there be sort of a natural evolution of thinking um, and, and affinitizing around the ideas um, as people discuss them and traded, you know, perspectives back and forth. Great. Thank you. So what you're saying, you probably figured out the game, right? In these in this technology, you're able to move your dollars. If you want to buy the $60 one, you've got to move six of your $10 buckets. Um, and so people get some quiet time and they think about what they want. And, you know, Glenn decided what was important to him. He cheated. I'm just going to say, Glenn, I know you took from community health and bought in Europe. But again, even, you know, jokes aside, in these methods, it's okay if people color out the lines because we're still getting what we want from the outcome. So Glenn was there. Um, Mai, I think, is on the call as one of his outstanding colleagues who did a lot of work. She had a slightly different perspective. There were six or eight of you in the meeting. We were able to tally on the side which ones were of greatest interest. And we didn't stop here. We didn't say, okay, thank you. We're done. We know what the answers are. We used this as an input. We said, thank you for thinking with us. Understand there's a lot of, a lot of possibilities. Now we're going to push you further. And we said that we're going to push you further using another method called a creative matrix. And in this method, we want to get a whole bunch of ideas from you. And we want to get those ideas from you based on specific challenge questions. So Glenn, touch a little bit here on how much work it was to get to these questions and how they actually, you know, served as an anchor for the work. Well, I mean, I think the overarching point is that it is so important to get the right challenge statement. And, and that's why some of the understand work is so important because that actually sets you up to come up with the right how might we's. If you're not clear about what problem you're solving, then it's really hard to come up with the right challenge statement. And now all of a sudden you're ideating and solutioning around the wrong things. And, and you can waste an awful lot of time and treasure going after the wrong things because you didn't validate either some of your assumptions, uh, the problem that you wanted to work on, or the challenge statement. So I would say that, that, that the challenge statements and the problem statements are probably the part of design thinking that we spent the most time and needed the most help on. Because I think until you've had a lot of experience getting it wrong, tinkering, getting it right. Um, you don't necessarily have the instinct um, that this is the right thing. And it is so hard not to put your biases into you know, your challenge statements or not to put solutions into your challenge statements. Um, so having somebody like Hannah who could sort of walk with us and give us a, an outside perspective, a fresh perspective, um, because we're immersed in it day to day, um, was just extremely valuable. Thanks, Liz. And I think, you know, you can definitely see in these particular challenge statements how hard the team worked to be provocative. You know, how might we help kids want healthy smiles as much as they want to go to Disney now? Right? That's going to push you to think outside of your box and I need to give them a toothbrush every time they come to school. Right? That's not the same. So this particular method relies upon really rich challenge statements. And it also relies upon thoughtful prompts. And the reason why the prompts are so important is because answering or coming up with ideas for any of these, it's just hard. A blank sheet of paper is just hard. So what I appreciate about this method from the Luma methods is that these prompts break the challenge down. So now I need to just think about that question in the context of tech AI or social media or in the context of partnerships or policies. And so I'm less intimidated as I'm coming up with ideas. And what we tend to do is we create a little healthy competition. There were, a, you know, like I said, seven to eight folks. We had two groups. They had a clock running, no more than 12 minutes or whatever it is. And at the end of that timing, we were able to say, well, group one came up with more ideas. We don't really care about the quality of the ideas right now. Just get it down. 
And then after that, we're always pushing, as you can tell, after that, we're looking for even more creativity. We layer on top of that another method called alternative worlds, where we say, okay, you've been thinking about all of this in the context of Delta Dental of Washington and what you can do. What if you were a different organization with different capabilities working on a similar problem? So for example, if you're a consultant designing a hospital room, you can think like a hospital or you can think like a hotel designing that, right? So we said to folks, who else has challenges like this? Logistical, you know, hard, big, complex. One team chose Apple, one team chose Amazon, and they went at it again, this time with yellow sticky notes. And now somebody else got a turn to win the prize, right? But all this is doing is creating space for ideation without limits. And what both of the groups had here at the end of this part of the program was a lot of raw material to work with. Now, what comes after this, of course, is converging. This is the diverge phase. So rather than spending too much time showing you converge exercises, we can do that in another talk. I'll just share here that what was, and Glenn, you can chime in here, what was so powerful about this is, and I actually have a picture of it, but everybody looks miserable because they're working so hard. I can put it, but what's so powerful here is you've got the CEO sitting next to the executive VP, sitting next to Glenn, sitting next to Mai, sitting next to the dentist, all doing this work together. And there's something very powerful about that experience, right? You never mind the collaboration and the diversity, just this feeling of teaming and that you're in it together. And yes, you have different jobs to do, but you all own and have a part in the success of this work. And Glenn, I don't know if that was, that, that's what resonated with me always the most when you guys were. Yeah, I'll just add really quickly. And I think somebody put something to this effect in the chat earlier, because um, you see this in the bio feature activity, a lot of the design thinking activities, it really creates a level playing field for participants. It doesn't matter what your title is. You get, uh, you get stars, you get to put ideas on the table. And not only does that um, lead to better ideation and, and more creativity, it also changes the dynamics in the team itself, because people who aren't accustomed to being able to sit at the table with the CEO and offer their ideas and have the same voice, um, they really get to sort of grow into their ability to contribute to what the team can do. And that's what you really want when you're doing leading transformation is you want everybody to be working sort of at the top of their scope and feel, you know, supported in bringing their best thinking forward. And so thanks, Lily. I'm not going to belabor the point here necessarily, but when I hear you speak like that, it takes me back to the beginning of our conversation. That you and, you know, you're thinking like a transformative leader. You're thinking about a lead, like a leader who wants everybody to be at the top of the game and wants people to feel connected to the work, right? And these methods are just gold when it comes to expediting your ability to do that. So at the end of this very long session, the drinks were waiting outside. We did our usual rose for bud, rose is positive, for what is negative, bud is, has potential. We wanted to see what people thought of the session. And usually it looks something like this, generally more positive. So if you want to score with your team or with your client or whatever, doing these design thinking sessions is generally a positive thing for them. They like the exercises. People like novelty, right? Many people haven't done this before. So it's interesting. Um, you know, good to hear each other's points of view, interactive, great energy, all that good stuff. Everybody has complaints. There's never enough time. It's hard to get up to speed. We need a bigger room. You'll always hear that. But the bats are really what's interesting because this is where you want to start to see what else could you do. And one of the things that popped up here was this question at the bottom. Can we somehow build an innovation roadmap? What do we need to build today that will enable our solutions for tomorrow? And we took that quite seriously then. And we built exactly that. We built an innovation roadmap. So do you want to just touch a little bit on the playbook and what it is and how you use it? We'll show a few examples and then we'll get ready for some Q&A. Yeah, well, we so we while we were learning this this new set of methods and frameworks for working, we wanted some 
um, repeatable processes, some structures that would help just uh, maintain some discipline around the way we wanted to work because we know that we're going to be pulled in different directions by the company and by changing things in the environment. So we asked um, Hannah and her team to help us build an actual innovation playbook that would say, okay, based on what we're trying to accomplish and the way we want to work, these are the methods we're going to use. These are the, the ways we're going to validate whether the things we're working on make sense to us, make sense to leadership. Um, it's going to create natural touch points for leadership to engage in the innovation work so that they know we're productive, that we're moving through a lot of ideas. Um, and we also wanted an ability to ingest lots of ideas and quickly evaluate them and either discard them or keep moving forward, but only be spending the right amount of time, the amount of time that we had validated uh, made sense uh, for a particular idea, a particular problem. Um, so this was a super helpful and it has become a, an indispensable tool for us in our work today. Um, in fact, I was just using it uh, yesterday because I got pulled ahead in terms of, you know, oh, here's some great ideas, some great solutions. I got caught up in some things and realized, oh, I've, I've skipped a few steps. I need to go back to my playbook and see what I've missed and see what I need to go back and pick up. And we spent um, a couple hours yesterday with our team, with my sort of going back through some of these exercises and saying, okay, what do we need to clean up? Do, are we still in the right place? And this was, this was super helpful in making sure that we were still going in the right direction. Thanks, Glenn. So like Glenn was saying, you know, what, again, we've done all this great work with leadership to get in alignment and all that, but leaders will be leaders and they will tell you to do something completely different the next day if that's what they decide to do. So Ned and his team, I think, were really reaching for something where they could go, the oh, but, we, but you signed off on this and we're not here yet. Or no, you may not jump to whatever new partnership you decide we need to do. And so we focused on building this playbook. We want to work on the right problems. We want to prioritize the highest impact areas of work, governance processes for decision-making, learnings and progress, so that people couldn't be whimsical in what they were doing and, and actually drive the team crazy. So we really did build this very structured playbook where we made sure that depending on where the team was, just like you were saying, Glenn, if you're already iterating, but you haven't actually discovered, you were able to know where you were so that you could move back and forth. And then not only that, within each of these sections, we made sure since we'd been using these methods, talking about them, we made sure to leave Glenn and the team with, oh, you want to do a prioritization workshop in discovery? Of course, you can do whatever you want, but here are some things to get you out of the gate. So some ideas for how to do the work and, oh, you want to do it in neural, here's the template for you to just fix. So we were trying to take, you know, the challenging parts of making, getting all the stuff set up out of the equation so that you could do exactly what you said you're doing, Glenn, focusing on getting it across the finish line in the right way. So that's the work that we did with Nairagi's team. Like I said, at the beginning, we also ended up, Lou was certifying his team. They're all design thinking practitioners right now. And um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Glenn, but I, I get the feeling that your team is really looked at as a, a capability or as having capabilities in the organization that are quite unique. Yeah, I think once word spread the way we were working, we've been invited to present this way of working, the innovation pathway, some of the initiatives that have come out of it to various uh, parts of the organization. And um, I think it has really helped um, us establish ourselves with, you know, the street cred so that leadership will, will really listen to what we're saying and they understand the way we're approaching the problem solving and the processes and all the artifacts that come out of this that create, um, I think, sort of a flywheel for much faster innovation and, and forward movement. Right. Terrific. So I'm just going to wrap things up for us a little bit so that we can get to some Q&A. Um, I almost don't need this slide anymore because I've said it so many times, but I think that the transformative, the transformative leadership and design thinking story in my mind is very strong because just through Glenn's examples and through others with our other clients, this is what happens when you naturally work this way all the time. And all of the words in blue are all of the things that the transformative leaders are trying to pull off. So I see the design thinking and transformative leadership connection come through very strongly in this kind of work, personally. 
And the last thing I just want to say is, you know, I'm I'm one person sitting in Seattle talking about how much I've been eating this, but this is this is a thing. There are studies out there. You know, IBM is one of the largest design companies in the world. They've trained 114,000 people in their methods. I mean, you there's enough content there to study, and they do indeed find incredible productivity gains that I see as well. And if we do this for no other reason than productivity, it's enough. This is just a much more productive way of working. We don't go back and forth. We don't do things for hours. We just get the work done. Your McKinsey are also big proponents. They talk about performance gains and shareholder returns and stockholder value. This is a thing. And those of us who missed it in our, you know, my daughter can do it in Girl Scouts and my son learns it in high school and their courses in undergrad now in, in design thinking, they were not available in my time. So if we missed it, um, all the things that we've missed, I mean, there's many things. I think that coming back to this one is helpful, personally. So I know that you've been asking questions all the way through, Melissa. Thanks for catching those. We have a little bit of time for Q&A. If anybody's popped something in the chat, there's a question for Glenn. Let us know. I'll invite folks to keep adding questions to the chat, but I do have some questions. Um, the first one is some excitement around how awesome the innovation playbook is. Um, and can this innovation playbook be shared? How can other folks get one? Well, you know, jokes aside, we so, at Salt, we've done innovation playbooks like this for clients and each client is different. So the first one I did was when I was still with Point B for Starbucks. And that was, you know, they had their own process and they needed their specific elements. Glenn needed his. We did another one for the Institute for Functional Medicine when they were doing partnerships with others. So I think the, the construct is, you know, it's basically the design thinking way of working. But where the partnership comes in is in understanding the specific needs of the client so that it can be targeted directly to them, which decreases the amount of time from, oh, here's the textbook, how do I translate it? Things get lost in translation here because it's hard. So I think it's important to invest in making sure that the team can use the playbook out of the gate and not have to reinterpret it, if that makes sense. But I'm happy to chat to whoever's interested about it to, to see how to at least get you going. Great, thank you. Um, this is a, a new one that just came in for Glenn. As you gain momentum at your company, is Hannah always with you or is there a certain amount of autonomy that develops over time? Good one. I, I would have liked, loved, uh, and I still would love to always have Hannah alongside me. I think that would um, always make me a more effective. Um, but we did develop some autonomy over time and there is a natural evolution where you start to realize you are figuring some things out and, and you actually can put, you know, one foot in front of the other um, without Hannah holding your hand. Um, and, and and that's important because we can't always have Hannah there and, and we need to be able to operate, you know, independently. So we talked about that and that was something we built into our relationship is how are we making sure we're prepared for that future where Hannah isn't going to be walking side by side with us down this path. We still catch up often. Yeah, we do. Just for fun. <laughs> and another good one. There are so many activities. How do you figure out the best activity to use for the situation? Hi, Teresa. I think that one takes practice. It just takes practice. I, I think, you know, when I think about when I first came out of training and thought I was ready to go and went off to my client and used a method and misused that method and messed it up, you know, it, 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 it's a deep skill set. I don't want to pretend that this is easy. You know, you're in these situations, you have to understand the situation. You have to understand who's in the room. You have to know how to design the flow. You have to be able to facilitate the methods. You have to make sure that you have one of the materials that you need ready to go, right? It's, it's non-trivial. But it's doable with practice and as Glenn experienced initially with some sort of support. So that support can either be, you know, public training, it can be bespoke training, it can be just coaching, it can, 
There's all sorts of ways of doing it, but I don't want to minimize the fact and pretend like it's easy. It's not easy. The other thing is that over time, you become more fluent and you start to modify the exercises to work for you. So the way, I don't know what you think, John, but the way that we use BioFeature, not traditional, not the usual way for using it, right? So I think that it, it's something that, that you just need to grow with over time, but you start somewhere and that's where the confidence comes in. Thanks, Hannah. Um, last one. Um, will participants have access to the recording or the materials that you shared today? Um, we're going to make the recording available. Um, the materials have, you couldn't actually see it, but all those sticky notes from Delta Dandel have proprietary content in them. So we won't be sharing the materials per se, but absolutely sharing uh, the recording for anybody who wants to hear it. And also, you know, happy to... If, if, Feel free if you if you thought this was interesting or if you're curious and you just want to chat about it for some time. Um, let's let's move to that of how we can stay in touch. You know, like I said, we rather than have specific offerings that you have to do this or you have to do that, we prefer to eat our own design thinking food and create whatever our clients need rather than a specific product that's on the shelf. So if you need help with an offsite, but that's all you need help. With. Or if you're curious and you want training for your team or you don't want anybody to know about it, but you want some coaching, we can play together and work together in that way. Um, um, needless to say, it's my favorite topic. So I'm happy to chat more. Um, but if there aren't any more questions, I um, really want to thank Melissa for keeping an eye on the chat for us. Glenn, Thank you for sharing your time and experience um, to the rest of you who made time to join us and stay with us. Really enjoyed having you here. <laughs>